Hello there. In its continuing efforts to plumb new depths, the United Nations effectively voted to support the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel. Oh yes, they did. On Friday night, the world became a more dangerous place. The United Nations failed to get enough votes to condemn the vicious terrorist attack by Hamas on innocent Israeli citizens on the 7th of October. And the result had many UN country representatives applauding. It's as follows. In favour, 88. Against, 55. Abstentions, 23. Having failed to obtain a th two-thirds majority of members present and voting, draft amendment A stroke ES 10 L26 is not adopted. As far as I'm concerned, those UN representatives are fully supporting the breaking of a ceasefire, which is exactly what Hamas did. And more to the point, they are fully supporting the atrocious, inhuman acts of violence against innocent people, including defenceless children. Now, I am aware that some people are saying a ceasefire right now will save lives being lost through collateral damage and that that is the only thing that matters. Sounds all fine and dandy, except that Hamas, while it survives, will do all it can to bring about the destruction of Israel and its people, nothing less. So any ceasefire now will be used by Hamas to regroup, rearm and move their military assets ready for their next assault. A ceasefire that Hamas will in future break anyway only makes them more determined to wreak even more carnage and then get yet another ceasefire, then rinse and repeat. In the long run, a ceasefire today could well, in fact will almost certainly, lead to greater loss of life over the next decade. Hamas will not get round the table with Jews, and that is the long and short of it. Not in any meaningful way, anyway. And all that is why Israel must obliterate Hamas and return normality to the people of Gaza. But 55 UN member states around the world have now voted to support terrorists. What sort of message does that send out to the world? and 23 countries hid behind the skirts of abstention. While many were absent and didn't vote, 27 of them. Ending in a failure to condemn barbarity, this from the United Nations that was set up to engender peace after the Second World War and the horrors of the Holocaust. And yes, that Holocaust did happen. And all the while, pressure is mounting on the country trying to defend itself, Israel, to agree to a ceasefire that can only damage it. Not so that aid can get into Gaza, no, more so that Hamas can regroup and then, when they are ready, once again break the ceasefire, kill more Israelis and somehow then blame Israel for it. All helped along by the gullible. And now we have protesters in London calling for an intifada from London to Gaza. Intifada means an armed uprising. Be in no doubt that this is a call for violence by those that say they want a ceasefire. The sheer double think needed to get into that position is breathtaking. Before the 7th of October Hamas attack on Israel, Gaza citizens were allowed to work in Israel and Israeli soldiers were not present in Gaza. 
or else there wouldn't be all this fake hoo-ha about them now going in. And that is not an occupation. In fact, you might remember that a couple of days ago I showed you an expert international lawyer, Natasha Hausdorff, talk about the Israeli right to self-defence in international law. Well, here she is again from last year, talking to Med Israel for Fred, all about the concept of occupation. So one of uh, Norway's biggest newspapers have uh, had uh, reporters in, in, uh, in the Israel in recent days and they have written um, several articles where they claim that Israel occupies Palestinian territories in violation of international law. And I know this is, you want to give that answer in the lecture? <laughs> Now, I, can you do it in one or two minutes? <laughs> of course. Um, well, the, the longer answer, of course, is uh, still up, I believe, on, on YouTube. It's a previous session I did for Leaf um, about the underlying international law determining the status of the territory. But the use of the term occupation with respect to uh, what is better termed disputed territories um, is uh, part of the, the legal political battleground the use of legal terms without their proper meaning. Um, the use of the term occupation in this case is essentially a political term, but it's pretending, it's masquerading as a legal term, which is why you often hear it coupled with uh, the description of illegal occupation. Um, and as a, as a reflection of what international law says, properly applied, I would argue, um, the status of the territory that Israel recovered in 1967 which had been under Jordanian occupation since the 1948-1949 war, has underlying Israeli sovereignty. And it's a rule of customary international law that tells us this, which is called uti possidetis juris. Very simply, and as straightforwardly as I can uh, muster, it basically says that a new state that comes into being inherits the pre-existing boundaries of whatever administrative unit preceded it. In Israel's case, when it declared independence in 1948, the pre-existing entity was the British Mandate. Israel was the only state to emerge in that time, and therefore by application of this rule of customary international law, the entire territory became the state of Israel at the moment of the Declaration of Independence. It's what the International Court of Justice in the Burkina Faso Mali case called the critical date. And it's at that critical date that you get a snapshot, a photograph of the territory. Now that doesn't mean that those are going to be Israel's borders uh, from now until time immemorial. Why is this rule of customary international law so important? Because it tells us what the original status of the territory was before Jordan's occupation. And it tells us that, therefore, when Israel recovers that territory, it's not properly classed as an occupier. The rules of occupation in international law have been completely misapplied with respect to Israel. It's been singled out, and these are double standards that are applied. And there's one additional example I would give you to sort of buttress the misapplication, and that's, um, you may all remember that Secretary of State Pompeo came out in the last American administration with his declaration, uh, essentially that settlements were not per se illegal, and this was a reversal of State Department policy that up until that point had been embodied in what was called the Hansel, Hansel Memo, the Hansel Memorandum. Even that Hansel Memorandum was clear that the occupation that at the time it was suggesting existed would not outlive any peace agreement between Israel and Jordan. That was a memorandum that was written before the 1994 peace agreement. So even by their um, inconsistent and inaccurate, I would say, reasoning, the term occupation, legally speaking, wouldn't apply uh, after a peace agreement between Jordan and Israel in any event. There are many, many layers of legal analysis that underpin the inappropriateness of the application of the term occupation. And it's unfortunately because of the complexity behind it that it's become so difficult to push back against it. But it's vital that we do, because the misuse of these terms, of occupation, of ethnic cleansing, of, of colonialism, of um, uh, expulsions, uh, these are, are all important terms under international law which are completely 
misapplied to Israel. They propagate falsehoods, but because they come with a veneer of legal credibility, people are afraid to push back. And I'm very happy to discuss this in more detail later when we look at the Amnesty International report and answer your questions. I'll be here for the yep. remainder of the day. But um, to arm yourselves with the key facts, to be able to push back against these falsehoods, that is the most important thing I think that you can be doing because that is the real battleground, the real arena uh, in which Israel needs additional support. That makes it crystal clear that there is no occupation. Anyway, here are the countries that voted in support of Hamas terrorism and coldly killing defenceless and innocent children, even babies, up close and personal. Sickening. Algeria, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Belarus. Well, what a surprise. Now we see which club those pro-Hamas supporters are in, don't we? Belize, Bolivia, Brunei, Jerusalem, Central African Republic, Chad, China. Surprised not. Comoros, Congo, Cuba, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Djibouti, Egypt. It won't condemn Hamas, but refuses to take a single Gaza Strip refugee. Think on that. Gambia, Guinea, Guyana, Indonesia, Iran. Well, Iran does back Hamas to the hilt, doesn't it? Iraq, Jordan. Jordan is another one who point-blank refuses to take any Gaza Strip refugees. In fact, no one in the region wants any Gazan refugees. Why not? Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, Lebanon, Libya, Malaysia, Maldives, Mali, Mauritania, Morocco, Namibia, Nicaragua, Niger, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, the country where lots of Hamas bigwigs live in splendour and luxury while their people suffer in Gaza. Russian Federation, Nuff said. Saudi Arabia, Senegal, Somalia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Syrian Arab Republic, Tajikistan, Tunisia, Turkey, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, United Republic of Tanzania, Yemen. Yemen is a country that is suffering attacks from Iran-backed Houthi rebels, but whose government is backed by Saudi Arabia. But all three, Iran, Saudi and Yemen, are voting together for terrorism against Israel. Just shows you that hatred for Israel transcends any other feelings in the region. Finally, Zimbabwe. Ah, and the UN Resolution number 2624 from February last year called the Houthis a terrorist group and added the Houthis as an entity to the Yemen sanctions list, subject to the measures of the targeted arms embargo in Resolution 2216 for having engaged in acts that threaten the peace, security and stability of Yemen. But Yemen does not condemn Hamas terrorists. And how many of these countries rely on Western foreign aid? And how many of these will we continue to give aid to in return for trade or whatever it is that the big corporates want? Anyway, the UN has shown it is no longer fit for purpose. The UN professes that it wants to bring peace and tranquility to the world. All that those 105 no votes, abstentions and no shows did was give succour to terrorists around the world as well as reduce their own rights to self-defence if they themselves are attacked. And they are also backing those that explicitly plan to put their own people in danger, Hamas. Here's the senior Hamas political leader, Ismail Haniyeh, speaking from the comfort of the aforementioned Hamas backing Qatar. كما قلت وفي كل مرة أكرر إن دماء الأطفال والنساء والشيوخ لا أقول تستصرخكم بل نحن الذين نحتاج هذه الدماء لكي توقظ فينا روح الثورة لكي توقظ فينا العناد لكي توقظ فينا التحدي والسير إلى الأمام 
Anyone backing a ceasefire is backing Hamas in reorganising its civilian shield. Not only that, Hanie got a call from the former Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad yesterday, agreeing with Hamas that Israel was committing genocide. But as that expert in international law, Natasha Hausdorff, said last week to Julia Hartley Brewer on Talk TV, there were 400,000 entries of people from Gaza into Israel in the first eight months of this year, mostly to work. And Israel has been providing Gaza with electricity, water and medical supplies. And all they got in return is Hamas breaching the ceasefire in the most horrendous way while indiscriminately firing rockets into Israel. And don't try to convince me that those rockets are aimed at military targets. Hamas does not care where they land in Israel. In fact, they don't even care if they fall within Gaza itself because they can easily convince the gullible that it was Israel's doing. And according to ABC News on October the 7th, air raid sirens begin sounding in Jerusalem around 6.30am local time, warning citizens of the attack in progress and to immediately take cover. An estimated 2,200 rockets were fired towards southern and central Israel, including Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, by the Hamas militants, according to the Israel Defence Forces. Meanwhile, Hamas claims at least 5,000 rockets were fired, all landing in southern and central Israel. Well, the truth is that a lot of them fell short within Gaza. And that's the indiscriminate enemy of Israel. No warning either. That in itself is the war crime of trying to inflict collective punishment. Just compare that to the IDF sending out warnings and dropping leaflets to warn those in Gaza of their intended targets. But further, we now find out that much of that fuel and medical aid supplied to Gaza by Israel and others was filched by Hamas to stock up in their labyrinthine tunnels for a long engagement with the Israel Defence Force. According to both Arab and Western officials, Hamas has been stockpiling supplies for years, which they have stored in tunnels they prepared for the possibility of a protracted war, says the Telegraph. Hamas is the problem. They also have huge storage tanks of fuel available for fighting, but not for their own hospitals. As an Arabic IDF spokesperson says, this is what over half a million litres of diesel looks like, while Hamas keeps claiming it does not have enough fuel to support hospitals and bakeries. And the IDF itself said, Hamas ISIS steals this fuel from civilians and transfers it to its tunnels, rocket launchers and leaders. This is what Hamas's list of priorities looks like. And Hamas apologists support this either knowingly or stupidly. But still the anti-Semitic shills keep on about Israel being the nasty one. Unlike the UK during the Second World War, for example, Hamas slink underground while they leave the defensive population above them to shield Hamas terrorists from attack. While in the early 1940s, UK defenders in London manned the lights and guns above ground while sheltering the masses in the shelters and the underground tube system. Hamas does the exact opposite. Hamas is not civilised. If you are a Hamas supporter, go and give your head a good wobble. It might clear out some of that cotton wool from your brain. But I have to wonder if those people really do care about those innocents in the Gaza Strip, or if they're just out there to give the West a bashing. And I do have to ask what those pro-Hamas, Jew-bashing protesters are getting in return. And when you see the Met Police snatching a placard with a Nazi symbol on it from a pro-Palestine march, you see the reality of it. It's a freedom of speech. You see, you're taking my speech. And note how this protester was trying to use freedom of expression as justification.
He doesn't seem to have much of a care for the human rights of those that Hamas slaughtered and those of Gaza citizens that Hamas hides behind in such a cowardly fashion. But I'm not sure if the police arrested him or just commandeered his placard. Maybe the Met is still trying to decide how many meanings the swastika has. Now, just for some perspective, the Syrian war has cost over half a million people their lives, plus millions maimed and more millions forced from their homes. The same picture in the aforementioned Yemen, with nearly half a million dead. And the slave trade is flourishing in Libya. But the only cause that the outraged want to support is that of anti-Semitic genocidal Hamas terrorists. To the point that the Home Secretary Soella Braverman and the Community Secretary Michael Gove have ordered a crackdown on extremism because of warnings that the UK has become a permissive environment for anti-Semitism. You could just weep. Back to the future, as they say. But now that Israeli forces have broken through what they call the gates of hell into Gaza, they must finish the job they were sent to do. Richard. I have to say the news this week that Boris Johnson has joined GB News confirmed my suspicions about the channel and backed up the claims of its former presenters who were sacked or faced constructive dismissal. Yes, claims of it being nothing more than controlled opposition. I mean, Boris Johnson, really? This is the man who shut down the country and pushed an agenda that resulted in our loved ones, many of our loved ones dying alone. Our children even dying alone. Ended family businesses built up over generations whilst he has now pocketed millions since standing down as prime minister. Oh, and this is the man who pushed a dangerous thing that has hurt and killed more people than it protected. And then he claims that that thing, that very thing was his, his crowning achievement. What does that tell you about the moral compass of GB News? as Boris Johnson joins the channel. And what does that tell you about the channel's commitment to freedom of speech when it, it boasts of Boris Johnson joining? A man whose government stamped down on free speech during the so-called so -called health emergency. Now, I know some of you will hail Boris's appointment as a, a triumph, a triumph of the channel in its move to replace the mainstream media. But I'm sorry, it is the mainstream media. It nearly wasn't. And it had such promise when Mark Stein and Calvin Robinson and Lawrence Fox were presenters there. But now it has shown beyond all reasonable doubt that GB News has unashamedly blossomed into the controlled opposition of, that, that many of us feared it always was. Yeah. And just like, as I said, many of the ex-presenters, former presenters, have highlighted. This is the channel that seems to be a retirement home for former Tory MPs former Tory ministers, with a few uh, sitting uh, Tory ministers too. Now, <laughs> I don't mind a bit of what some might call right-wing rebalancing in the media. We desperately need it. But the Tories are not right-wing. They are part of the Uni Party, along with Labour and the Lib Dems. Oh, and don't forget, once upon a time, Boris Johnson was a Liberal and pushed the woke Liberal agenda. He certainly did as Prime Minister. Yes, there are still a few decent presenters on GB News, and I have respect for Esther McVeigh and her husband, even though they are Tory MPs, but GB News can no longer be taken seriously as a home of free speech when they have sacked their presenters that pushed the free speech envelope, only to replace them with a former Prime Minister and other Tory MPs from a government that clamped down on free speech during the global bad cough. Neil Oliver is the last dissenting voice left, and he looks, he looks markedly alone and isolated these days, and I wish there was a channel. Just one channel with Lawrence Fox, Mark Stein, Calvin Robinson, Maya Tusi, Katie Hopkins, Neil Oliver himself, Dr. John Campbell, Julia Hartley Brewer, the lads from Trigonometry, to name but a few. Sorry if I've left any of you out. Oh, and of course, our Jeff, yes. I would never get asked because I am, well, I'm far too me. But I think that Boris's appointment to GB News will annoy the audience built up on the channel by the likes of Mark Stein, who won over viewers with his controversial and anti-establishment views that were opposed to the actions of people like Boris Johnson.
So when Boris joins the team at GB News, there will most definitely be a strong sense of betrayal. A strong sense of betrayal by the channel towards its loyal viewers. Although, I think that might be a boat that has already sailed. Anyway, I just find it flabbergasting that an incredulous man who told people not to mingle and stay at home and didn't allow singing in funerals whilst having karaoke parties in his, in his house, I suppose you could call it, 10 down the street. This man is now joining the so-called channel of free speech to give views on world events. Who cares? Boris has entered the Tony Blair club of ex-prime ministers with zero credibility. Who is the target audience for Boris Johnson? I doubt very much that the remaining established audience of GB News will welcome Boris Johnson, considering the channel's viewership was built on former presenters on the channel slating him. So who is this appointment supposed to appeal to other than Nigel Farage and Dan Wooten? Actually, I wonder if Dan Wooten will be coming back to, to GB News. After all, I mean, in between having a pop at an inconsequential prince and his wife, Dan loved Boris. Which I assume means he bought into the narrative of Boris's government. Hmm, maybe. Nigel Farage is hailing the return of Boris, saying, What a lovely bloke he is, and, and he's great company. Um, in fact, I have a mutual friend with Boris Johnson who says he is a lovely chap. And to that I ask this simple question. Do you stick the final nail in the coffin of your free speech credentials of your channel in order to gain kudos from somebody who is clearly a huge part of the anti-free speech movement? Regardless of if Boris Johnson is excellent company when socialising, I mean, Vlad the Impaler might have been a good laugh at a dinner party. Just don't let him anywhere near the cocktail sticks with the cheese and pineapple on. Did, did any of you lot, you also used to like the cheese and pineapple on the stick combo? Let us know in the comment section below. And no, we're not data mining, I'm just a bit nosy today. But anyway, back to point, sorry, I'm rambling on here. I mean, call me old-fashioned, but my definition of someone who is nice isn't a person who poisons a population with experimental drugs. But <laughs> hey, that's just me. But GB News and many of its presenters will be welcoming Boris to the channel, and with that in mind, you decide if you want to continue to watch the channel. Look, years ago, even I thought, do you know what? Boris Johnson is like a breath of fresh air, and his buffoonery and quick comebacks could be a sign of a certain type of intelligence with a, a gun-ho attitude that is so missing from today. Only one problem there, though, with that, that sort of line of reasoning. It still, still doesn't mean that he isn't a c who is capable of destroying people's lives with no remorse. Please place Boris Johnson's move to GB News into its correct context before celebrating it. Look at what he did and his legacy, and if you still think him becoming a presenter is a good thing, then I have no more to say to you. He's about as useful as Diane Abbott on your quiz team. Unless every answer to the, each question in the quiz night is racist. Right, you lot, we know you love to voice your opinions in the aforementioned comment section below, so fire away! And Jeff and I will read them, and we might learn something from you. Yeah. Anyway, here we are. The cringeworthy part of the video that feels like I have just twisted one of my balls. Right, so I have to ask you for your help and support to help th keep this channel going. Well, if you can afford it, please. Support us via Patreon, PayPal, or via YouTube itself. Links in the descriptions box below. And a huge thanks to all of you who have signed up to a monthly contribution on Patreon and donated uh, via PayPal, PayPal and YouTube. The price of a pint donated to us helps us keep, well, it just helps us keep making content and keep going. And speaking of which, we will hopefully be kicking off something completely different on the channel for our next Sunday show, next week. So we will be gearing up for that over the next few days. We hope you will like it and support it. It's something that Jeff and I have wanted to do for quite some time. It's a bit new, it's a new format for Sundays, when we can get time to do it, so our love to you all, especially to those of you that hate us, and God bless you all. Bye for now.